My name is Dr. Martin Brown and I'm a general and advanced heart failure cardiologist with the Sydney Cardiology Group. Today we're going to be talking about diastolic heart failure. If you find this presentation useful, you can access the slides via our website. So we're going to start off with a case of an 80-year-old lady who has a background history of type 2 diabetes, chronic renal failure and hypertension. She presents to your rooms complaining of pedal edema and exertional dyspnea. When you examine her, you notice that she has an elevated JVP, normal heart sounds and bibasal crepitations. She also has swelling of her ankles. You request a chest x-ray, which shows you pulmonary edema but normal heart size. The questions that we'd like to address during this talk is what is the most likely diagnosis, what further investigations would you like, and what treatment will you instigate for this 80-year-old lady? So before we come to the answers to those questions, I'd just like to give you a little bit of background about heart failure. We're currently on the cusp of a tsunami of heart failure, and if, looking, if you look at the statistics here, we can see that up to 5 million patients in America are currently suffering from heart failure. So 277,000 patients in Australia alone equates to 1.3% of the population. That's an incidence of 30,000 new cases per year, with a burden of 200,000 bed days in New South Wales alone. At a cost of $1,000 per day, this totals $2 million a year for the New South Wales government. Heart failure readmissions are high at 30% at one year, and whilst mortality has been reduced from 50% at one year in the 90s, we are still at a high level of 10% per year mortality. When talking about heart failure, we must think about the left and the right ventricle and whether it's diastolic or systolic. In this presentation today, we are just concerning ourselves with left ventricular diastolic heart failure. So what is the definition of diastolic heart failure? Sometimes it has been called heart failure with preserved systolic function, and also heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. I personally disagree with these terms because no one has been able to decide on what the definition of preserved is. It is sometimes classified in as ejection fraction of 35%, 40%, 45% or 50%. But true diastolic heart failure means you must have a normal ejection fraction of 55% or above. That is why I only ever use the terms heart failure with normal ejection fraction or heart failure with normal systolic function. This is not to be confused with restrictive cardiomyopathies, although there is often an overlap in syndrome. So what is the pathology with diastolic heart failure? Well, we're all familiar with systolic heart failure, where there is usually a thinned and dilated left ventricle resulting in a reduced ejection fraction. In diastolic heart failure, the muscle is often thickened or hypertrophied, and the ejection fraction is often normal, i.e. 55% or above. So the problem in diastolic heart failure is that the thickened myocardium is stiff. The contraction is normal, but relaxation is not. During diastolic relaxation, blood is sucked from the lungs, and so when this is impaired with a stiff ventricle, the resultant effect is congestion of the lungs and pulmonary edema. So the reduction in initial left ventricular relaxation can be compared to a set of bellows. When using bellows, you squeeze them to push the air out, but you also actively pull them apart to suck air in. And this is the abnormality in early diastolic dysfunction. In late diastolic dysfunction, when the ventricle is stiff, the atria have increased difficulty pushing blood into the ventricles. This can be compared to the swollen cheeks of Dizzy Gillespie when blowing through a trumpet. So who gets diastolic heart failure? It tends to occur in elderly females, particularly those who are diabetic with a history of hypertension. It can also occur in patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy or aortic stenosis. The other common group it occurs in is those with coronary artery disease where it can coexist with systolic heart failure. So what signs do these patients have? Well often they will have coexistent atrial fibrillation and they will be found to have an elevated jugular venous pressure with or without pulmonary hypertension, which can be elucidated with a right ventricular heave and a loud P2. They will often have bilateral crepitations or pleural effusions and signs of right heart failure such as hepatomegaly or ascites. So what investigations do you want to perform in a patient with diastolic heart failure? Well, although not covered by Medicare, BMP is a very useful test to elucidate for heart failure. It is elevated in both systolic heart failure and diastolic heart failure. 
A chest X-ray is an easily available test and will often reveal signs of pulmonary edema with a normal heart size. This is often the clue to diastolic heart failure. An ECG may show left ventricular hypertrophy or atrial fibrillation. Also look for left atrial enlargement. Ultimately, an echo will give you the diagnosis. When performing an echo, we look for left ventricular hypertrophy, left atrial size and volume, mitral inflow and annular velocities, and left ventricular mass. During a left heart catheter, we will often measure the left ventricular end diastolic pressure, and if elevated, i.e. over 16 millimeters of mercury, this will indicate diastolic dysfunction. This slide on BMP shows us that BMP is elevated in both diastolic heart failure and systolic heart failure, but not in non-cardiac causes of dyspnea. This is an ECG of left ventricular hypertrophy, although the patient is in sinus rhythm. You can see the deep S wave in V1 and the tall R wave in V6. There's also a tall R wave in AVL. This is classic for left ventricular hypertrophy. This is a transthoracic echo of a patient with diastolic heart failure. As you can see, similar to the picture of Dizzy Gillespie's cheeks, both the left atrium and the right atrium are severely dilated, consistent with a restriction in relaxation of the left ventricle. So what is the management of patients with diastolic heart failure? Well, unfortunately, we don't have a lot of options. Controlling the blood pressure and maintaining sinus rhythm are vital because these patients will often feel worse if they're in atrial fibrillation. If they have obstruction, such as hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy or aortic stenosis, then they require surgery to relieve that obstruction. We treat the congestion with diuretics and we look for the other causes of their symptoms. Currently, there is no evidence for the role of ACE inhibitors, angiotensin II receptor blockers, digoxin or sildenafil. There's a possible role for beta blockers in diastolic heart failure, although the entry criteria for the senior study stated a left ventricular fraction of 35% or more. And as I mentioned earlier, this is hardly preserved systolic function. Recently, there have been two published trials suggesting that spironolactone can assist in the management of diastolic heart failure by reducing left atrial size, echo parameters of diastology such as E to E prime, and also heart failure admissions. For my patients with diastolic heart failure, I currently recommend spironolactone 25 to 50 milligrams daily as there is no other treatment options available. So what are the take home points about diastolic heart failure? Well, diastolic heart failure is common and is especially common in elderly hypertensive females. It results in impaired left ventricular relaxation, producing stiffness of the left ventricle and resultant symptoms similar to systolic heart failure. In the community, a BMP, ECG, chest X-ray and transthoracic echo are simple initial investigations which will help you get to the diagnosis. Treatment options are limited and consist of diuretics and spironolactone as well as maintaining sinus rhythm and good blood pressure control. I hope this talk has been useful to you and if you want more information, you can download these slides from our website.